Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar presented by Global PMI Partners, the post-merger integration specialist. I'm gonna wait just a few moments just to let people come on. I see some people are joining us. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Give everyone just a couple more seconds here. And I think we'll get started. My name is Jen Koppen. I'm the moderator for today's event. We also have with us US partner, Scott Whitaker, Nordic's partner, Michael Holm, and senior executive advisor, Per Ivan Salinder. Our webinar today is how to use M&A transaction and integration playbooks to enhance your organization's M&A capabilities. This is the third topic in our webinar series dedicated to the post-merger integration process. I'll talk briefly at the end of this presentation about our previous and upcoming webinars and how to register. Before we begin, I'm gonna go through a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. It should be located at the top or the bottom of your screen. We aim to address as many as we can at the end of the presentation, so feel free to type in your questions at any time so I can add them to the Q&A list. Also a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be sent to you and also available on our website at gpmip.com. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Scott Whitaker, our partner in the US, is a recognized expert in M&A and has authored the books Cross-Border Mergers and Acquisitions and the Mergers and Acquisitions Integration Handbook. Michael Holm is our partner in the Nordics. Michael has led post-merger integration and carve-out projects for corporations and private equity firms across multiple industries. He has also co-authored the book Cross-Borders Mergers and Acquisitions. Per Ivan Salinder, a senior executive advisor in the Nordics, has extensive experience with post-merger integration in telecommunications, IT, and gambling sectors. He has also built many companies from scratch, helping them to achieve profitability. I now turn it over to Scott Whitaker. Thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, what we wanted to cover with uh, everyone today is uh, a few things. First is to share a little bit of knowledge um, on our side on how to leverage Playbook Solutions really as a catalyzing platform to build more mature M&A uh, project and planning and execution cap capabilities within your organization or for some of you for your clients. Um, our Playbook scope um, in this case will cover both pre-deal and integration, which we refer to as the full M&A life cycle. Um, so we'll hit both topics. Um, and one of the, the key themes is really addressing life, life challenges across that life cycle. So in the course of the discussion, we'll discuss common challenges, capability gaps uh, for acquiring companies trying to do this better um, across uh, parts or the entire M&A life cycle, and then provide insights on how to uh, facilitate a more lean and structured approach and methodology to acquiring and integrating new companies. And we will endeavor to um, hold some time at the end for questions. And um, so uh, Jen, when I get them in there, we'll get to those, your questions first, um, and uh, hopefully have enough time to, to get through a few of those. Next slide. Uh, just quickly about us, I'm gonna buzz through these slides quickly so we can get to the content that you're interested in. Um, we uh, do um, have done about 350 M&A projects uh, globally to date um, in about 35 countries and have about 75 dedicated professionals. Majority of our business originates um, in the U.S. and kind of U.K. Europe region, uh, but we have people throughout as their M&A tentacle stretch on any kind of integration or acquisition project to other parts of the world, obviously. And um, so we have people there that uh, can help um, when uh, the scope, scope requires it. Next. So quickly about our services and where we're focused today. So our services are, are very specific in integration divestiture services, car, uh, integration carve out planning and execution, post-close transformation, and then M&A capability development and where we're focused today is uh, where you can see the box, integration carve out playbook development and M&A transaction playbook development. These are services that we provide for um, what you know, are commonly referred to as serial or strategic acquirers, people that are doing more than one a year 
um, and are trying to build a, you know, more robust and consistent internal capability to scale. Just a couple, a few clients that we've done it for um, and, and all types and in, in, in terms of industries and also transaction types and transaction sizes. Um, and we'll get into kind of our playbook approach and, um, and, and how we don't believe in a one size fits all. Um, and a lot of it is learned through the unique requirements of our clients um, that we've uh, done throughout the years and, and bringing that forth to more flexible solutions for um, people that we work with. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Michael who will uh, talk about pre deal playbooks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks, Jen, for the next slide there. So what is a playbook? The, the playbook term originates from American put, football for the non-US participants. A football team prepares a playbook for each game it plays, depending on their analysis and strategy tactics to win. Analogy with an M&A playbook is to have a playbook for each deal rationale that you will see um, you, you're doing. Um, a playbook is a set of plans and a methodology for different pre-planned scenarios. Designed to provide a methodology adapted to, your, to you and your deals and transactions to governance and guidance and rules for the, for the acquisition a basis for stringent and tailored execution, a warehouse of knowledge, and most important, it is re repeatable. Who should have a playbook? Uh, companies that will grow by uh, acquisitions, of course, but also those who need to maintain a tool set and leading practices and need a repository tailored and built for repeating success. Jen, next slide. And next slide. Thank you. So let's walk through a transaction pre-deal process and its phases from a playbook perspective. So I'm gonna go through the green boxes here, starting from the left. The process starts with pipeline and identification. Next is the initial business case analysis. Then you have a gate moving over to acquisition proposal, another gate, letter of intent, due diligence, another gate, and the contract or the share purchase agreement and closing, and then it moves on into the integration phase. Each gate document covers, uh, firstly, the strategic rationale in the bottom left there, which is all about value creation and synergies. Next is the acquisition proposal of how this deal will be put together. And next is an acquisition report, which is summarizing the previous phases when you go into the contracting um, uh, part of the, uh, the funnel. In sports, you have a playbook to win, to be prepared, to have your tactics pre-rehearsed. -re Pre-deal, funnel or, or a transaction funnel is an M&A funnel, it's not, um, and it's similar to a sales funnel where you start with a large number of targets at the beginning and end up with one or few transactions at the end. For private equities, it's a magnitude of 100 to 1. They look at 100 companies to invest in one. For corporates, it is less in the beginning of the funnel say 10 or 20 targets to uh, one acquisition. As corporates are more restricted to industry, current business, and more selective, most corporates try to aim for 80% of the targets to be sourced from internal ideas. But another reason is also that um, some corporates have a slow, fragmented, and too detailed transaction process with many stakeholders. Those that can really benefit from a transaction playbook. So if you want to look at 10 to 20 targets to acquire one, if you want to step up your acquisition agenda uh, to three to four 
you know, well, four to five targets per year, then you need to look at 50 to 100 targets. If you want to step up your agenda even more to eight to 10 acquisitions per year, you look looking at 100 to 200 targets that needs to move through the M&A funnel, all other things being equal. So you need to set yourself up for success. Again, to make the comparisons with a normal sales funnel, in which you have prepared intro presentations to prospects, you have prepared product marketing material, offer letters, proposals, contracts, terms and conditions, service level agreements, etc. You can then in a sales funnel measure each hit rate in each part of the funnel. You can measure the velocity of a target or a prospect that moves through that sales funnel and which deals to avoid and that you want to do also in an M&A funnel. So if you have a customized methodology in your M&A funnel and in your M&A process, you can look at more targets and increase your chances of finding the best fit and the one that creates the most value. An example is, for instance, your M&A strategy is to expand your market footprint by buying distributors. The more you look in each country or each market, the higher is the probability of finding the optimal target. With the methodology, you can also effectively activate the internal organization in finding targets by setting up the M&A pipeline in a way that enables divisions business areas or country and subsidiary CEOs to scout for targets and do the initial evaluation. A playbook is then helping to communicate and keep those scouts in line with changes in target selection criteria and improvements in the process. If we look at the business case analysis up on the slide, and the rest of the process, there need to be clear decision criteria aligned with M&A strategy. And those are the gates that you need to pass. And while you also need to be able to follow market dynamics. If you describe those in a playbook and provide templates for analysis that is required and the documentation that must be ready for each gate, you can start to tweak the whole process uh, in a lean way, make it lean, not just make exemptions or additions for each deal. Advanced analytics is also now in use by some serial acquirers, and this is an area which we will believe will grow going forward. To use advanced analytics in, for instance, due diligence, you need to have your process and methodology laid out. You cannot do it and that effectively, if you have do this in isolation only during the due diligence, you have to have the whole process in place. Jen, could you switch slides, please? Then some principles for playbook development. How often is the M&A pipeline documented and presented to top management and board? That is a key principle and a key question for you to, uh, to, uh, to answer. We argue that the pipeline need to be discussed at least quarterly. And I know that some serial acquirers do it every month, but it also, need, also needs to be part of the daily work at an M&A or corporate development unit as targets move through the, the funnel. And if you build a playbook, it needs to support both the monthly or quarterly to board scenario, as well as the daily work from, from um, the m and team. In the pipeline, you can also have different triggers for those targets that you have parked in the m and pipeline. For instance, a target could be parked and will not be moved to the next step in the m and funnel until the growth rate is then say 15% over three years. So you wait um, with targets until they're mature enough to, uh, to buy them. Looking at business case and consistent acquisition proposal, 
um, there is a lot of, um, when we come in and, and talk to clients, there's a lot of customized documents and Excel for each deal. And they don't need to be that. Part of the presentation and evaluation of a target and a business case in numbers need to be standardized to enable comparison across targets. So in the scenario that you look at 50 or 100 targets, you need to be able to compare those in each stage of the pipeline. Um, you also need to validate synergies, uh, hold unit and individuals accountable towards those synergies and present in the end the results from the acquisitions. And these need to be included in your acquisition proposal and business case analysis. And sometimes in, in some um, deals we have come across uh, when we come in that someone in the deal team came up with their percentage figure and um, it really doesn't set you up for success if you don't validate your synergies carefully. Regarding governance, uh, we've covered that before, but each gate is there and the criteria needs to be met in order for you to move along uh, in the M&A funnel. Due diligence is then a huge effort and, and a huge subject in most transactions. We cannot really dive into that in detail today, but uh, in a playbook, there is the opportunity to adapt the due diligence to the deal rationale and reduce the scope of the, the um, um, due diligence. And last but not least, down to the right, is the approach to soft factors. That is extremely important in, in our practice and in, in our experience. And you need, and you, those soft factors are culture, leadership, key staff, communication, and change approach. So you need to build that into the playbook if there are importance to the deal rationale. For instance, then how to approach the target leadership is key for success in, in transactions and integrations where you have entrepreneurs selling, selling to you, selling their company to you. Jen, next slide, please. This is just um, the same layout for the integration and post deal process illustrated on this side. We have the same governance gate and documentation principles as for the pre deal transaction process. We start in this picture in the top left green box with a signed uh, share purchase agreement, a signed contract and closing, then move on to a gate start to do an integration analysis, another gate, integration planning, another gate, integration execution, that's, that's now our implementation, uh, gate seven, handover to line management, and then integration follow-up. Um, these gates are in an integration scenario very much work stream dependent. So we have a number of sub-projects underneath the integration project and all of those sub-projects are also called work streams move through these different gates at different times. For instance, the IT team might have a lot of analysis and come to gate five a lot later than for instance marketing who um, has perhaps in, in some integration an easier and a faster task uh, of integrating. So now I will turn over to uh, Per Ivan Cylinder, our Nordic Senior Executive Advisor, to do a pre-deal playbook demo. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> okay, um, can you see my, my screen? I presume yes, so. Yes, we can. Yes, we yeah, can. Good. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm going to showcase to you a, uh, a generic transaction playbook, which we have built up in, uh, in teamwork in this case, one project management tool of, that we uh, use extensively. Um, it's based on uh, 
the assumption of that we're, we're going to work with internet gambling companies where I've done a few integrations and uh, it's one of the versions of the playbook for integrating uh, companies of the same same size or smaller but basically doing the same type of business as you're doing perhaps in different markets so that's the backdrop to um, uh, to this uh, uh, playbook um, as you saw in Michael's uh, uh, slides before, uh, you have the gates uh, defined. And so I usually start with defining in the task uh, section uh, the different transaction milestones and in particular for each and every one of them, the, the outcome. So in this case, the strategic uh, rationale, which then includes the strategic fit uh, and analysis of the SWOT and the uh, expected benefits from the acquisition. Now, obviously you need to detail that to a, a much further degree. And uh, uh, I tend to work with it in the way that I set up a number of different areas where I work through what is needed during the different parts of the, of the uh, transaction process. And then I link all those activities into the uh, transaction milestones uh, on, on the top. So for instance, uh, just to give you um, an understanding, um, if we talk about the understanding the, the, uh, uh, the, the customer acquisition process of the target in the internet gambling industry, it revolves around a number of areas. It could be traditional marketing, it could be uh, search engine optimization or banners on other sites and bought by pay-per-click, direct traffic, or it could be affiliation or others. And you need to look into all of these, of course, and, and uh, do your homework and see where they're uh, performing and not performing. And you need to list a number of KPIs that you analyze. And, and uh, two of them are listed here, or one of them is listed here. It's the um, overall customer acquisition cost. So you need to establish that and you need to establish the customer acquisition cost for, for each uh, channel. Uh, but you also need to look at the sustainability of that customer acquisition cost going forward. So this is the way you work with um, individual tasks and individual areas. And when you're ready, you can go back and, and link them up to the correct gate and, uh, and complete your project from a task point of view. Um, usually it's a, a couple of hundred different uh, tasks that you, you need to, uh, to consider. And in, in this tool, you can also, of course, uh, add subtasks. You can, you can add follow-up and you can add who can see what and, and, uh, and all sorts of uh, uh, tools to help you guide the project. Um, another area where you can, uh, uh, where you can add an uh, overview is on the milestone. Uh, you can, in the tab for milestone, you can add all the milestones and toll gates that you're having in the project set them up as regards to responsibility and uh, when they should be ready, et cetera. Uh, the other, apart from tasks, which is where you find you will uh, be working a lot, is the files area. So this is the repository for all the files in the project. As this is a non-started project that I'm showing you now, there's a lot of templates here, but you can see, for instance, uh, there's a communication matrix template that you can use for start to planning all your your communication with all all, uh, all involved parties um, it could be um, transaction training or indeed the uh, overall description of, of the whole uh, process itself so anything you upload here you can set uh, priorities so you, you can uh, assign who can view uh, or if all can view it and then you can link it into the tasks as well so uh, that's an important uh, uh, repository for all your, uh, all your documents. You can also set up uh, different standardized uh, templates like charters for the sub-projects, which you want to look the same way, uh, or you can have checklists uh, set up so that they, uh, they can be reused. And last but not least, I want to show you, we're also using the risk analysis or the risk register where we list all the different risks we see in the project. Uh, we do evaluations of the probability and the impact of those risks. And out of that, we get a, a priority list. 
So we focus on the, uh, the, the biggest risks and uh, the most important risks. And with that comes also the impacted areas and the mitigations. Uh, there are also other things you can do in this tool. You can, uh, you can report time and you can have billing and you can assign people and do all sorts of, uh, of changes. So it's, it's pretty flexible. So uh, with that, I, uh, I hand back to uh, you, uh, Scott, to uh, continue. Thanks, Pro Ivan. All right, uh, next slide, Jen. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about, um, focused on the integration uh, phase of planning here. And I noticed some of the questions coming in. Um, you know, in, we typically, for our clients, will start integration um, at LOI um, or with PE clients when they have exclusivity, you know, and or LOI. Um, and typically, you know, we'll start the process formally 30 to 60 days ahead of the formal close date. Sometimes we get a little more time if it's going through regulatory review and you know things extend. Sometimes it can be a lot shorter um, just because you know, sometimes people get, the, the deal is all consuming and by the time people pivot to thinking about integration and figuring out they may need some help, um, you could be several weeks away. Um, and, uh, but you know, our, the, the, you be very much essential to start your pre-planning before close, of course. So we'll talk a little bit about that next. Uh, next slide, Jen. So, you know, the, the path to mature integration um, capabilities, there are some foundational things. Oh, go back, Jen, please. There are some foundational things um, that need to be in place uh, first. One is the M&A lifecycle process we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, there has to be something formally mapped out um, so things connect seamlessly between corp the corp dev process and the process I'm about to um, undertake here. Um, if it's, you know, if it's uh, in its own box and not very well managed um, or it's an abrupt transfer, it's really going to be hard to optimize uh, your integration playbook ca capabilities because you're going to have trouble coming in. Um, and so that's a huge dependency. Do you have that mapped properly? Next is metrics and KB, uh, KPIs. So clearly defined success metrics, KPIs for synergy tracking, other key things that represent integration complete. It may be um, in terms of you know, employee engagement, when you want key processes um, aligned or stood up, um, you know, it really varies by transaction. And then of course, there are always unique requirements dictated by transaction type uh, industry, timing, uh, sometimes regulatory um, concerns um, in the review process, and all that goes into building a, a platform. Um, in terms of benefits, I'm, I, I chuckle a lot of time when people, we get called in, people say, you know, with especially people with a lean background, Six Sigma background, say, I really want a lean playbook. And I'll always say, you know, playbooks are, should be lean by definition. And when you look at the benefits um, here, um, you'll see a lot of things that kind of represent lean characteristics and, and lean program in terms of facilitating a lean and structured approach, repeatable methodology, um, very defined roles and responsibilities for people that are participating um, in the integration process, very meticulous documentation on how work gets done and when and by whom, et cetera. Um, Continuous improvement of integration process. Any playbook um, that you implement, you should do an after action review, update based work plans, update process, update tools, templates. It's living um, and should continually be optimized by the learnings of, integration, uh, of each integration. Um, process adherence um, eliminates non-value added steps and time waste. Process adherence also scales the time people have for integration work. We never get into a situation where people are dead, or seldom I should say, dedicated to 100% um, to an integration. Um, you know, they're, they're, they may have to spread that time between multiple integrations. Um, they may have 25% of their available time to do what we need them to do. 
A playbook process helps scale the available time for executives and functional leads and other stakeholders for the time they need to spend. Um, and then last, enables integration planning, execution improvement, and uh, activity in a systematic way. Next slide, Jen. So our development principles um, focus around six key areas. I'll describe these. I, these are the kind of lens that we look through um, when we're developing a playbook solution for a client. Um, first is strategic. These are all important. I'm going to just go through them in order, uh, but I consider all six to be uh, essential. Um, strategic alignment. So it, it has to tie, obviously, to your, your, your kind of base acquisition strategy. Um, for example, you know, if you're a steady kind of aqua hire type acquisition model, um, if the playbook is more suited for, um, you know, manufacturing and facility type uh, transactions where you're acquiring a lot of um, assets um, or plants or manufacturing facilities, distribution centers, that really doesn't help. Um, and so it has to be aligned with the type of deals and transactions that you're doing. And there may be multiple flavors, and we'll get into that in a moment. Adoptability is key. Um, you know, people need to see the value right away on why it's beneficial to use it. Otherwise, you know, people will kind of resort to, um, you know, what they know works to kind of get it behind them, not really interested in, in process improvement, just want to get it done. And so you're continually, you never get better at it um, when you do it that way. But, you know, it's our job to make sure people see that clearly, understand the benefits right away, um, and you don't have hurdles to adoption um, across the enterprise. So it's no good if one BU um, is fully on board, adopts it, and another BU doesn't. You're still in the same boat. You have inconsistency across the enterprise. You have one group doing it the way you want um, via the playbook. You have another group kind of doing it the old way. Everyone needs to see the value right off the bat and use it. Um, consistency, um, playbook, all the supporting tools um, must be consistent across integrations. Um, so we, you know, what I, my rule of thumb is try to get 80% of it consistent. There's always going to be some, in, you know, something someone needs to do different. A diff, you know, they need to use a different version of a template for something. The process needs to be tweaked because of a unique requirement. That's okay. If you can get the 80% tamped down and consistent, it gives you more time um, to, to apply to those things that are unique and different and maybe where, you know, a lot of value is derived as well. Simplicity um, is a big one for us. Don't overbuild. Don't over-engineer. Um, focus on basic needs and layering complexity as needed. You can always augment based on transaction requirements, um, size of the deal, geog geography that needs to be covered. You can always layer in things that you need. If it appears too complicated and overbuilt, it will, it will uh, kind of uh, delay adoption um, or prevent it. Um, so we always start simple. Knowledge transfer has to be built to be trained. Um, you know, our programs are built to assume that an IMO lead or an IMO manager or whatever a particular company calls it, takes the program over and deploys the playbook for subsequent acquisitions. Now they may be help, need help down the road based on the scale and just need bandwidth. But the idea is, the whole idea of doing it is that you can do it yourself at some point. That's the whole idea of doing a playbook for somebody. So the knowledge transfer part, thinking about how you train it in, um, how you administer it, how you govern it, et cetera, needs to be factored into any solution. And flexibility, we talked about it. It just, there are no, um, there is no one formula that, that suits all transaction. It has to be modular. Um, you have to be able to allow for some flexibility on transaction types other nuances for your industry, that's okay, you build it in. Okay, Jen. So the uh, development cycle kind of looks like this, um, and I'll, I'll say the training in part is the most critical step. Um, discovering requirements, those, this is really finding out what you're doing 
how it's going, what you've done well, gap analysis, um, and then looking at kind of future archetypes for acquisition activity. So what, what do you need to be prepared um, to do and what should the playbook support? Examples might be, you know, we need to be able to do two, um, you know, every quarter. Um, we need to be able to do two kind of aqua hires every quarter and then maybe one kind of transformational integration um, once a year. What does your M&A, you know, um, plan look like for the next um, three to five years? And what you want to kind of do is, is build to that and future proof it and don't just build it to the requirements of what you're doing today but build it to the requirements that you need today, but that will satisfy the requirements of tomorrow as well. And so that's part of what we do in step one. Two is just the, the, the development. So it's, it's building all the things that you're gonna need, the process, the phasing model, um, tools, um, specifics for the transaction, et cetera. Um, and then three is training it in. So figuring out, you know, uh, you know, who on, on um, the transaction team needs to be trained, maybe a, you know, tr a training for a specific integration coming up, maybe train the trainer type thing where you're training PMI leads within the organization to deploy the playbook. Um, but how are you, um, that, that's a key step in the process. And then ideally, you could, we like to deploy a beta version if it's the first one um, on a live transaction. Um, accomplishes a few things. One, you can train it in um, and optimize it and tweak it, things that you learn. Hey, we, we didn't think we needed this template, but it uh, turns out we do. And so let's build it in. Um, and it, it gives you a chance to kind of sell it, get some quick wins, merchandise. Hey, you know, we, we, we use the playbook on this, this um, our, our first transaction since we, uh, with the playbook, we saved some time, things went a lot smoother. We had a better day one. We got a lot more done in the first 90 days than we thought. I mean, these are things, again, that you can play back to uh, help spurn, help drive adoption and get people to use it consistently. All right, Jen. Um, typical process, it's not a long process. Uh, typically takes about 90 days. Um, the and a lot of it's dependent on schedules too. Sometimes in, in the discovery and requirements, it's just getting people nailed down and schedules lined up um, and that can take longer. Um, but, but the deliverables and that and discovery and requirements is kind of that capability roadmap. I mean, what are you going to need today? What do you need tomorrow? Month two is the uh, playbook um, development where we look at you know, the model, the process, technology platform, uh, governance model, and I'll talk about technology in a moment. It's an important topic. Um, and then all the, the baseline work plans, checklists, templates, tools, everything that you're gonna be used that just makes scaling a program easier. So, you know, your, your day one employee resource guide, it's the same template, it's the same approach, it's the same topics, the answers are different. Um, but you're starting from something that you can repurpose and save a lot of time on. Month three is the training and simu simulation, and then the deployment will just depend on your M&A um, process and when you have stuff coming up that, can, uh, that you can use the playbook on. Okay, Jen. So before I go into examples, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the example that I'm gonna show um, for it, it's a sanitized um, example built in a SharePoint environment and leveraging Smartsheet, which is what this particular client used. Our stance on tools is we are officially tool agnostic. We've built playbooks um, in a lot of different tools. Um, our approach, our philosophy goes back to what I shared on some earlier slides about kind of simplicity and consistency. But if you're using something already, um, you know, I'm loath to introduce yet a new tool into your organization uh, when people may be, you know, um, trying to learn something else or, you know, we've been doing integrations on this, people understand it, they know it. Um, we're very flexible in that regard. If there is no preference, we'll certainly come in with a recommendation. Um, and, you know, one of the things, if you go to our site, I think on the news and resources, there's a great M&A 
um, there's a great white paper on, on software tools um, that'll show you kind of, you know, what there's a, there's a wide range of um, software tools across the kind of M&A software map. Some are great for M&A pipeline management. Um, obviously, we are all probably all the folks on the phone here are aware of a lot of things that are for um, data room management, BDRs. Um, and then there's, you know, kind of bifurcates there for things that are good for integration. Um, things that are more for generic project management, and then some things that are cover all of those. Um, and so it's really important before you select one to kind of know how you're going to use it. I mean, if it's, I want to manage the full M&A life cycle, not just integration, not just the pipeline, well, that might point you in one direction. If it's I just need a, a great, something simple for integration and project management. Well, that may be another pipe, another area. Um, you really need to get squared away on what your, your organization can stomach um, in terms of a new tool. Cost obviously has to be taken into consideration um, before you select and decide on, on what you wanna use. Okay, Jen. Um, so I am going to, um, Give me one second here. Jen, if you'd stop sharing, I can, um, I'm going to pull up a, an example. Okay, you see that okay? Um, so this is a, uh, an example of a uh, integration hub that we built in Smartsheet. And one of the things, or in SharePoint, excuse me, there's a Smartsheet component, which I'll get to in a moment. This um, particular client used SharePoint. Um, people were familiar with it. They used it for this type of activity for some other project management type um, challenges. And so we built it in here. One of the benefits of this is we built this as not only kind of the, the integration hub for all M&A activity, integration activity, but also as the training portal. So when we build it, we use it for application, but we also use it um, you know, imagine the IMO, the uh, project manager having to train the trainer. Um, we want to make sure they have something like this that kind of had, they can go through quite easily soup to nuts, the integration process and be able to um, uh, show everybody how, how things get done. And so the key areas that um, you'll want to cover are governance. So what's your governance model? Um, these are examples in here. So this would be, you know, your typical companies governance um, model for yeah, how you manage most typical integrations. And there'd be more content on, on how you wanna train that and, and explain roles and responsibilities. Um, next, the process. And this is really, I wanna spend a little time on this. So this is a, a, an actual process for that a few of our clients use, but this is a phasing construct that we built with them. Um, you know, this particular one is we had phase one was pre-planning. Phase two was the kickoff, the IMO kickoff. Phase three was plan development. Phase four was execution. This is a, you know, this is a very common um, organizing construct, but it's not to say it's the organizing construct. And so for each of these, um, you know, we'll build with the team what is encompassed in pre-planning. So, you know, FAQs, again, think training, knowledge transfer, things that have to get done in terms of object, objectives, who needs to be involved, what are the inputs, what are the outputs. Some best practice is, again, think of training. Um, and then just checklists for things that we know need to get done in most typical integrations. Um, and this is one of those areas you'd wanna update after each integration, there may be some things that you add. Um, and then, so that continues that same construct for the same thing for the kickoff, for the plan development, same organizing principle, um, you know, best practices, inputs, outputs, who needs to be involved, and then you can use this for training. Tools and templates is your library um, to use for development of key inputs and deliverables. So example, integration strategy, example, you know, there's a template here. Planning assumptions, there's a template. Um, and then for each phase. So these are things you wanna encourage as mandatory use templates. So everybody's doing it the same way. They're not freelancing. Hey, I came up with a new 
data harvesting template that I'd rather use. No, use this one because we're all using it. And frankly, we think it's you know better than anything that we've used to date and it's faster and simpler. Um, so all those things are here for people to, to pick off and use. I'm trying to hurry up to give us time for Q and A. Um, and then uh, th this is your link to active engagements. Um, again, so you would go through here. In this case, we have a kind of a, a, a sanitized uh, fake engagement up here, uh, Acme integration. But you would here you would have you know Project Alpha, Project Beta, Project Charlie, any active integration going on that you could go into that particular portal. Um, uh, first, the governance tools and work plans and, and flash reports. So you could go into the, if I wanted to see the sales and marketing work plan for Project Alpha, um, I, I go in here. We use a tool called Smartsheet. And you know, you're into looking at that plan. And so Smartsheet is a simple tool uh, that we use. Uh, we've worked with Smartsheet to configure it for M&A integration activity, make some tweaks to it. Very simple to learn, adopt. Uh, it's very reasonable um, in terms of a, you know, an IT or operational expense. Um, and we find that people that don't have a preference for a particular tool or don't want to take on the, the cost and administrative burden, uh, burden of a new tool, Smartsheet for most integrations is, is quite applicable. And so it's, um, you know, but we, again, we're tool agnostic. We built them in other things. Um, just happens to be um, an easy thing for people to adopt when they have no preference. So um, I will uh, stop sharing now. And um, Jen, we can go back to the deck. Thanks, Scott. Um, we are now into our Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any um, questions, please put them into the Q&A box. I see that a couple were answered by Michael. And we do have a few more that had come in previously. We'll start off with those. Um, I can direct this one to Per Ivan. Within a playbook, there can be many versions, like one for bolt-on acquisitions, one for product acquisitions, and perhaps one for when you require a company when complementary market coverage. How many versions of the playbook should one set up? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It it, uh, it depends on, uh, of course, the uh, the type of acquisitions that you foresee, and the number of acquisitions and the frequency. Uh, so it's hard to answer that in uh, in a, a single sentence. But uh, uh, I I would probably uh, uh, set up one uh, as uh, the prerequisite and then add more as you you go along. So you can't really say one. One individual answer to that. I'll, 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 uh, I'll set up a, a couple if you have a couple of different cases. That's what I will do. Okay. I have another one I can direct towards Michael. You mentioned that soft factors are important in pre-deal. Could you be more specific on what those are? Uh, thanks. That, that's a that's a good question. Soft factors is is uh, very much in front of our um, uh, in front of us each time we go into a project. So. Um, culture or mind share between the two leadership teams of the um, acquire and the target is very very important to to achieve and you you want to achieve that as early as possible and um, and that is valid for most deals and most playbooks and especially if you do roll-ups or build-ups as they're also called if you buy from entrepreneurs uh, or if you buy tech companies you 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 need to um, you need to win over the leadership, and you do that uh, in 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 a simple way. As I think, a simple way is is to focus on the future of what you can to do together uh, when you have merged the two companies or when you have rolled up the company, and what will be their role going forward, and and to have that clear. As early as possible, a pre-deal uh, uh, would be uh, uh, great uh, uh, to do so, and and I think that also um, puts a lot of uh, uh, you know issues to rest if you can make that clear to the entrepreneur and focus on that, and then that uh, soft factors also then moves moves down into 
the next layer, not only the entrepreneur, but the leadership team. They might be a professional team. They want to know what's going to happen with them, um, as well as key stakeholders in the, the target company. And sometimes also, also in the acquirer, when you buy something that um, might affect the, the people in your own company, you need to put those uh, things to rest, those soft factors, and create that alignment of, of the plan going forward. So that's uh, uh, perhaps a long-winded answer, but, but uh, it is always a lot you can say about change management and, and those soft factors. Thanks, Michael. I have one I'm going to direct towards Scott. Do you have any specific software tools you recommend for M&A playbooks and or program management tools? Uh, yeah, well, back to the um, what I was saying before, um, our stance is to be tool agnostic. Um, when somebody says, look, I'm looking for something really simple. I don't want to spend a lot. Um, you know, we'll look at something very basic like Smartsheet uh, configured for them. If they're saying, look, I, I want to fix integration, <coughs> but I need to fix the front end too and connect it all together. You know, there are tools like Medaxo and, and others that cover the whole life cycle. Um, but, you know, you have to be committed to using all of it. It's, you know, the worst thing in the world would be to buy something um, and use half of it and then be paying for the whole thing. Um, so again, I think that if you um, direct Go, go to the site and look at that white paper. It'll give you an idea of, of kind of which tools span which areas um, so you can make the right selection for where you really think you're gonna use it and uh, avoid paying for something that you don't need. Thanks for that. We have a question that has come in. As we all know, culture alignment is the biggest challenge. How and where in the funnel do you start the change impact analysis? I'll take that. Um, so in our pre-planning regimen, we usually um, will include a cultural assessment. And um, so this is, you know, starting 60 days, 30 to 60 days out towards close, either through a combination of qualitative and quantitative, like a diagnostic survey, but getting some information across some key dimensions about um, the culture, where you're alike, where you're different, um, you know, what things are valued and, and why. And, and I think we've all probably, people on the phone know a thing or two about kind of cultural diagnostics and the way, but it's how you use it. That's really important. So finding out is important um, and not just relying on, you know, kind of hearsay or executives are, are famous for saying, well, we're, you know, you know we're, more, we're, we're actually a lot more alike than different. Well, that, because you guys have been working together for a long time down the line, it may be a quite bigger story. Um, and so you really got to find out, get the facts. Um, and then, how you incorporate that into your um, cultural integration and communications and change programs so in terms of how you're using that information. What work streams is it informing? What are you picking out to address as things that you want to communicate and talk about on day one because they really matter? Um, what are things that are just going to be more change management things that need to be built in to how you uh, do you know, systems or process integration, et cetera? Um, figuring out how to use the information and leverage it is just as important as doing the exercise in the first place. Okay, I have another one um, that came in previously. I can direct it towards Michael. How do you get C-level to respect the transaction pre-deal process and or playbook? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, both the C-level and, and, and um, the board and owners uh, wants to uh, make exemptions in the process and, and running ahead and, and taking direct contact with the target and want to be deal makers and, and, and so forth. And, and I guess the short answer is um, you need to communicate how important it is for all in the organization that you, that you really follow the process. And, uh, and that you communicate when you do exemptions and or you jump out of the um, uh, of the pre-rehearsed play, so to speak. And that's, you need to be agile and that, that you have to be agile in business and agile in, in M&A. So certainly there are uh, times when you um, um, uh, don't follow the process. Um, but as I said, communication, change management, uh, alignment and agreement with the C-level that this is important process. If you're going to process that many targets, 
and acquire that many companies, you have to follow a process and you cannot make exemptions all the time. And normally these um, C-levels get to respect uh, a process and a playbook once they have seen it in action uh, for a number of, of, of deals, then, then uh, you really win them over. Um, so that's, um, that, that's uh, the answer to, to that one, I think. Okay. I have another question. What is the most important in a transaction pre-deal playbook? Scott, would you like to take that one? Uh, well, uh, um, actually, I'll let Michael take that. I'm sure he has an opinion since it was um, his portion of the topic. Let me uh, pause sure. that one to him. Sure, I'll do that. And, and um, you know, I, I showed kind of a simplified model of the pre-deal process there in the integration process, and they came up some uh, some very relevant and good questions on on how things, I mean, if you see it as a funnel, we have a lot of targets in the beginning and you end up doing uh, some acquisitions in the end. Um, you also, on the other way, you build up knowledge as you move through the funnel. And whether you, know, you build up that knowledge earlier on or uh, if you do those tasks later on, that can of course move in between the different parts of that process. But there is a number of of, of gates that you know the board wants to see before you go out and, and hire lawyers to do due diligence or financial advisors to do financial due diligence, then they would like to see the case. Um, so you have to follow that. So one of the important items is relevant governance gates. And we've seen clients where they, you know, that fall in love with their own analysis, with their own um, transaction and they really like the people in this company and they forget to be objective. So you need to have that governance in order to be objective. Um, one thing that is very important also is to customize the methodology. It could not be, you know, one methodology for all the companies in the world. You have to think about what is important for the acquisitions that you're going to do in the same way that uh, Scott talked about the integration. So you have to understand the deal and, and adapt to it or already pre-deal. And another thing I believe is also to um, understand the pipeline criteria and what it takes to move things along that pipeline. It has to be easy to understand for all the people. Sometimes you have companies where there's a lot of people involved in looking at potential targets, as I said, it could be up to 100, 200 a year that people are looking at, then you need to have simple and understandable pipeline criteria and standardize as much as possible. Just as you do in a sales process, if you, know, you try to standardize, if you have a lot, lot volume of deals, then you try to do 80% according to a standard process flows. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think we have um, limited time to take this one last question. At what point do you start designing the change management strategy? Really back to Michael. I don't know. I, I'll turn that over to Scott. You were into change management earlier. Could, could you? Yeah, I think um, it depends on when really when you um, uh, get, get the output of your diagnostic. And so it should, it should start immediately when you have that. So first of, first of all, you got to figure out um, what, what you're going to need and the requirements. But as soon as you've um, completed that, you should start the designing in the change management as part of your integration program. And um, I pref preferably, it's all baked into your uh, integration planning and ready to pivot to execution mode on day one. Great, thank you for the answer. I think that brings our Q&A to a close. I just want to th say thank you to everyone who came on today. Um, please visit gpmip.com forward slash connect to contact today's speakers regarding M&A playbooks. Also be sure to check out our website as we continue to post advice and articles that will simplify your post-merger integration process. If you enjoy social media, we constantly post articles and news, so head over to LinkedIn or Twitter and follow us. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.